Hello, Lower Sixth, and welcome to the lesson on either 28th of April, period five, of your L6C, or 30th of April, period five, of your L6B. This is the one I said you'd really enjoy. Ha, 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 ha. Right, as you know, we're looking at the liberal reforms, and what we've done, what I've done, is divvy it up into groups. So there'll be a lesson where we look at you know the workers there'll be a lesson where we look at the elderly and today is the lesson where we look at the youth now i recently worked out how this uh, recording malarkey works on the internet so i don't want anyone saying that i'm not down with the kids and in order to prove how very down with the kids i am i've written the entire powerpoint in text speak. So today we are looking at that. So take a few moments, get that down. Perfect. Um, it's easier than it looks, this. Look, liberal, liberal reforms to help the youth. There we are, liberal reforms to help the youth. Written in text for you to look at to go for. To go for, to go for. There you go. Yes, this is definitely saving time. So let's begin with education. Now, pretty much this slide is self explanatory. I mean, I don't even really need to, as far as I'm aware, say anything at all about it. I think I think that that does it all. If you'd like to just pause a moment to get that down. OK, excellent. Now, I mean, on the off chance that you can't understand any of that, let me take you through it properly. Education. Well, primary education had already been established by Forces Education Act, Mandela's Education Act, all the rest of it. Okay. However, that hadn't actually solved the problems. Um, still issues of child poverty, still issues of neglect, still issues of children moving into crime. And as you will remember from um, the Balfour administration, secondary education was sort of patchy at best. Um, at an independent school but um, the London School Board had tried to provide state secondary education and got into trouble over it. Um, admittedly, the Education Act that followed had, had sort of sorted that out a little bit, but it still wasn't great. And of course, we can't get away from the concerns of Germany. Germany are doing different things, so Britain needed to change. And um, as you were governments, the 1880s and 1890s saw a dramatic increase in um, uh, what we call vocational training. So individuals began to train for specific careers rather than just learning reading, writing, arithmetic. And the table here shows how that works. So um, if you wanted to be a chemist in 1893, it took you a whopping 23.7 hours to learn all of chemistry. Um, by 1901, you were being trained for 52.1 whole batch of extra stuff. Um, although I think they did split the atom at that time, but I think that's probably beyond the level needed for most pharmacists. Um, you could be a carpenter. I mean, to be honest, what is this, period one? No, period five, right? If you start, right, it's 1893. By the time school finishes at four, you're a qualified carpenter. Um, on the other hand, in uh, 1901, you needed to train for 23.1 hours. A plumber uh, saw the increase from uh, 6.8 to 19.6. And mechanical engineering. Now, this this one is the one which I'd sort of be a bit careful with. To be honest, mechanics in 1893 weren't that amazing. By 1901, mechanics had got a lot more complicated. So it is it is partly the case that they actually had to learn some new stuff because some stuff existed in 18, sorry, some stuff existed in 1901, which didn't exist in 1893. So it's not like there are extra pipes or something here, but here there are genuinely extra motors and valves and um, crankshafts and rotors. And, and with that, we've exhausted my entire knowledge of mechanical engineering. So let's move on. So that's, a, that's the background then. Basically, education is um, patchy, but an area which the government is beginning to feel it needs to pay serious attention to. 
Okay, so we begin with the 1902 Education Act, which um, obviously was introduced, as it says here, by this guy, but L4, well done, Balfour, N. Robert Morant, Morant created the Act, um, Balfour Education Act, and the Balfour Education Act, if you can't remember, said all of these cool things. Yeah. Excellent, good, top stuff. But, not advertising BC, that's a but. There's this issue, which leads to this. And that's a problem. And so is that. So, again, take um, four to five minutes to attempt to work out what I've got there. Um, don't worry, if you can't work it out, the, um, the true version, the, the real version is coming in a few moments. But you've got to admit, I worked very hard with this. Okay, you slackers who just skipped ahead to the uh, uh, to the bit where I take you through it properly. Both, basically, these guys, Balfour, you know him, and Robert Morant, who's an educationist, created the Balfour Education Act, which um, got rid of a lot of school boards and replaced them with local education authorities, which had the power to oversee uh, secondary educational and technical colleges. Uh, grammar schools... Um, were not invented by this, they continued, but they were brought somewhat under the umbrella of government education because they began to receive grants from local education authorities to take poor children who had some degree of quality um, educationally. So if, if we're thinking back to this idea of new liberalism, you know, equality of opportunity, this is a great example that LEAs are paying the good schools to take the poor but good children. So... That's, that's a good example there. And it allows for the building of extra state schools if required. But the Balfour Education Act, as you probably remember, comes with some serious problems. The main one being the fact that people paid for the schools via the rates, which were non-denominational, and the schools that they were paying for were Anglican, which led to a series of rate strikes where individual um, rate payers refused to pay the local taxation, the, the rates are the equivalent of the council tax now, and they refused to pay, which led to serious problems and concerns and, you know, cash flow issues and so on. Um, additionally, you can get away from the age old problem with education, which is you take a kid and you put them into school, they're not being put into a factory. And many families still needed, let alone wanted, children to be working from the age of 12. They needed that income. Um, when you went to the school, the style of learning that you were given was a uh, parrot fashion. So you were expected to sort of stand there and repeat um, your times tables. Now, so they'd get you to repeat, you know, eight times seven is uh, 56. Um, that was quick. Let's just check that. Yeah. Okay. Eight times seven is 56. Hooray, go mathematics. Um, but... You know, anybody can say it. It's a different thing to understand it. I mean, I can um, I can tell you what it says in a book about oxbow lakes and um, alluvial plains and whatever, but I'm not a geographer. I don't understand it. But I could learn it parrot fashion without knowing what it meant. And that was kind of what happened at the schools. There's a lot of parrot fashion learning. Okay, so how did the liberals feel about that? What was the liberal reaction? Well, fundamentally this however this so in 1907 that which secured this and you can't forget that either take a few minutes work it out okay broadly speaking the liberals agreed with most of the 1902 act they were obviously happy with the idea of expanding education. They were obviously happy um, with the idea of grammar schools being able to take poor children with LEA grants and so on. They didn't agree with the prominence of Anglicanism within the education system, but they weren't prepared to condemn the whole setup on the basis of that religious favoritism. And uh, coming into power in 1905, winning the election massively in 1906, in 1907, they passed a, a piece of legislation which did this. All secondary schools who received any kind of grant at all 
from um, the government had to give a quarter of their places to children from schools that have been built before 1902. You're possibly wondering what is the significance of schools being built before 1902. The answer is that it was the 1902 Act which increases the prominence of Anglicanism. So schools that were set up before 1902 were less likely to be Anglican. They were much more likely to be non-conformist. So what this did was it secured a place in secondary schools for children from non-conformist families. The upshot was not just that the non-conformists were benefiting, but grammar school places were essentially now freely available. If you had a child, there was a chance that they would get one of these 60,000 free grammar places. They were free because the government had said in 1907, if you receive a grant, you have to give this stuff. So you couldn't charge for it. You couldn't say we're more, we're, you know, we're legally obliged to give you this uh, place for your child. Now give us the money. So you got free grammar places. Now, right at the end of the Liberal administration in 1918, there's a further education act. It's called the Fisher Education Act sometimes. Uh, we don't really want to worry about the Fisher Education Act right at this moment because it's on the next slide. But if I just simply say that was passed as well, um, but it's probably a little bit um, minor. Okay, It's well outside the general period of the liberal reforms. The general period of the liberal reforms is considered from 1906 to 1911. So the fact that this is 1918 uh, means it's probably considered rather distant. Anyway, let's see what it does briefly. Well, knock yourself out with Fissures Act or the 1918 Educate Act. Okay, so what were the motivations of Fisher's Act? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, aren't I? You've just got to look at it, you kids with your blonde hair, think you're so great. Work this out then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, there was a lot of it. So, I might want to pause there, take a few moments, see if you can work out what's going on educationally. Think you're all that. <laughs> you weren't all that, were you? You had to go onto this slide to find out what it says. Right, well, the motivations for Fisher's Act. First up, they found that the previous education acts were very good at getting children into school, but they're not particularly good at getting children from schools into jobs. And it had something to do with that parrot fashion learning. Um, so they decided that they needed a further education act. Uh, secondly, a report commissioned in 1917 said that the school leaving age should be raised to 14 because basically by age 12, you didn't have enough time in education to get all the facts. And thirdly, they were actually trying to combat child labor, child labor. By um, 1910, it's broadly agreed by most of the people in government that child labor is something they'd like to avoid. Obviously the um, industrial class families don't necessarily see it quite as black and white in that, as, as we said, because of, you know, working child's bringing in money. But um, despite a general government wish to avoid child labor, child labor had actually increased between 1914 and 1918 because of World War I. The able-bodied men go off to fight and somebody is needed to step in and do that job. And sometimes it's a woman and sometimes it's a child. So in order to counteract the, right, the, the rise in child labor, they said, well, let's raise the school leaving age to 14. So what did the Fisher Act do? Well, firstly, it did raise the school leaving age to 14. Um, secondly, it made LEAs responsible for further training, although this part of the act was never enacted. Um, what happened after World War I was um, it was noticed that all the stuff that they'd wanted to do, all of the um, excellent uh, schemes for building a better world were actually really expensive. So they just never did them. So that part, further relevant training to be provided by LEAs, local education authorities, never enacted. Um, the LEAs did get the right to investigate truancy, and uh, it actually became a criminal offence to work if you were age 12 or, or younger. Um, if you wanted to work in a mine or a factory or similar, it was an offence to work in it if you were under 14. So 13-year-olds couldn't get away with it either. Um, the exception was child actors. Um, yeah, we couldn't have had Oliver 
if um, if Fisher's Education Act hadn't have put this in. Child actors and performers had to have LEA licenses. Um, LEAs were able to inspect workplaces to check that you weren't surreptitiously employing a child, although frankly why you'd want to do that is completely beyond me and um, there were increased medical inspections in schools um, it's actually the liberal reforms of 1906 1911 period which um, starts medical inspections but these increase in fisher's act okay so those are the two big developments in this time period the fisher education act and the 1902 education act and you'd be sort of justified in saying hang on that that doesn't really um, fill me with confidence about the Liberal government because they didn't pass the 1902 one and it, they weren't really Liberal in 1918 because it was Lloyd George leaving a Liberal Tory coalition, um, which is true. Um, but we will look at some of the further changes in a moment. Um, for now, if we take these two acts together and we draw the efferul, 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 over, overall conclusions, then we can say that yes. Yes, it's tricky. That's not so bad. It's probably quite good. Yeah, bit of a thorny issue there. And of course, that's a problem. You know the drill. Pause and restart when you're ready. Okay. Um, it progressed in fits and starts. There were There were time periods where the government was prepared to look at education quite seriously, and there were other times when it really didn't want to prioritize education, such as, for instance, World War I. Um, World War I causes serious problems. It causes massive disruption. Um, it also causes problems within the education system. It causes problems within the job market. It causes problems within finance. So it's a little harsh, I think, to say, oh, look, the liberals missed this big opportunity after 1914 to do something with education. I can't see why they'd want to prioritize that. Um, the liberals also faced a problem which the conservatives didn't, which is... Yes, they're in favor of educational reform, but they're also the party of nonconformity. I think it was uh, John Vincent called the Liberals the party of nonconformist conscience. So they had to try to work with a system which was Anglican whilst not making themselves come across as Anglican, which was kind of tricky. So they're hamstrung a little bit. Um, it is to their credit that they created a thousand secondary schools by the time the First World War started, and 35% of them. Uh, were just for girls, which is great because girls' education was way behind boys' education. Um, vocational training also increased, which is beneficial. Um, however, even if you were at the best state school, that could still not hold a candle to private education. Um, prime ministers continued to go to uh, very, very elitist schools for quite some time. And um, that really was the final point, which is that private education was geared towards getting particular jobs. So we mentioned that, you know, if you wanted to go to the diplomatic into the diplomatic service, you'd go to Oxford or Cambridge. And I think it was one particular college. I think it might have been Brazenose, but I can't remember. Um, basically produced something ridiculous, like 40 percent of all, all foreign office servants or something like that by the, you know, by 1900. Um, and the state didn't really do that. It made you, some would say, a jack of all trades and a master of none. Now, it seems like we've reached the end, but we haven't reached the end because all we've done is look at two education acts. And the Liberals also did many other things which helped the youth, but not always directly in schools. So let's have a quick look at those. Further changes. OK, so 1906, we have that, um, which by 1914 means this. 1907 there, by 1918, 1907 again. And again, 1908, 1908, 1909, leading to 1912. Pause and think. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not certain that these e really need a lot of explanation. School Meals Act, free school meals for the very poor between 5 and 12, although some schools already offered this. Um, by 1914, 14 million schools are being, uh, sorry, 40 million school meals are being provided and it becomes compulsory. So I did mention last time that some of the um, acts of the liberal reforms were permissive. This is one of the rare ones which is permissive, but by 1914, it becomes compulsory. Um, in 1907, child welfare centres are developed, although the volunteer industry, the volunteer sector really works with that. Um, as were care centres for children. These were organisations which looked out for children and tried to provide them with um, 
well, I don't think they'd have called it well-being in the same way as we mean well-being now. But yeah, you know, um, clothes, food, shelter, non-violent parents, that kind of thing. Um, by 1918, you've almost got 1,300 of them. And again, consider it's only got seven years before World War One comes in. 1907, births have to be registered. They always did, but people kind of got around it. It just reiterates, I say it always, 1837, Peel makes um, registration of births, marriages and deaths compulsory. Um, because births are registered in 1907, it means that the government know who is a mother. And when they know who's a mother, they can arrange for that mother to have basic instruction, which leads to mothercraft being taught in state schools, which is simple stuff like, um, you know, the needs of a child, um, how to look after a child, how to uh, change the nappy, how to breastfeed, all that kind of stuff, which, um, to be honest, had largely just been passed down from generation to generation, can actually be taught in state schools, which is very useful. Um, the same year, we see the school medical service being set up, which is the start of medical inspections in schools. Um, although <laughs> this is a bit awkward because sort of what, what would happen is the doctor would turn up and go, mm, yes, you've got rickets next. And they say, well, can I have something for my rickets? Well, no, not unless you've got the money to pay for it. So 1907, they could tell you what was wrong with you, but but they charged you to make it better. It's a bit cheeky. Um, couldn't insure children from 1908. You're probably looking at this going, hang on a minute, I'm pretty sure there was something else going on about this earlier. And there was, but quite often the government had to reissue legislation because people basically didn't listen to it. Um, 1908 again, the Prevention of Crimes Act established bore stores, young offenders institutions, so that you don't take somebody who was unsuccessful in committing a crime because they got caught and bung them in an adult prison full of a batch of people who have committed way more crimes. Um, 1909, you have about 250 health visitors employed by the government. 12, infant mortality has fallen to 95 deaths in every 1,000, which compared to 20 years previously when it was 163 deaths in every uh, 1,000 is very impressive. So that's all looking pretty good. Um, just to end on a sort of equalizing note, the limitations of the act. Well... Firstly, there was, I'm just going to do this one um, <clears throat> as, as is. There was no regulation of what went on outside the school. You'll notice that most of these things are to do with school. And whatever happens outside isn't for the government's, uh, isn't for the government to say. You know, the Englishman's home is his castle and it's not a castle you can get into. So still some problems there. Um, they're still largely dependent on charities and voluntary workers to um, plug the gaps and make these reforms happen. Um, all medical treatment still usually costs money. And uh, you've got to remember that the Liberal Party was not prepared at the minute to abandon completely what had made them the great party of the 19th century, individualism. It was still considered sacrosanct to the... Uh, majority of MPs. There were ways in which you could improve things, but you did not take away people's rights to do stuff or people's ability to do stuff. Okay, that is education. Now, as far as I'm aware, we've got this lesson on, this is Tuesday's lesson um, for Lower Sixth C. We've got a lesson for Lower Sixth C on Wednesday which will be on pensions. And if you're low six B, you're listening to this uh, on Thursday, which means we have a lesson on Friday, which is pensions. The lesson after that, which for low six C is uh, Thursday, I think we might do a Teams to catch up on what we think about liberal efforts to help the youth and the elderly. So whilst I can't be very definite at this stage, uh, what I would say is whichever class you're in, expect a Teams meet, a, a video lesson or a conference call or whatever they call it in the lesson after this one. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.